Behold the greatest champions of the Deathless God, and you will see symbols, pus oozing from unhealed wounds, acrid clouds of toxic gas swirling around them, worm-like creatures with gaping maws hanging from their bodies, and buzzing swarms of plague flies fill the holds of their ships and swarm on the surfaces of desecrated worlds of the Death Guard. Watch as they shatter the enemy's lines of defense, impervious to return fire. Hear their bubbling voices as they sing praises to the Lord of Decay. Breathe deeper and feel the full power of the vapors, pumped by power packs that work on flesh. Watch the enemies writhe in agony, coughing and screaming as their bodies bubble and swell. See the ragged throngs of mortals following them with reverent zeal, desperately begging for even a trace of their gifts. Look at how they have subjugated demonic engines that so crave the flesh of mortals and feed on rot and larvae. Look upon the galaxy to see the festering sores in the domains of the corpse on the throne. For today we shall speak of the blessed guardsmen of the Death Guard, the most favoured followers of Grandfather Nurgle. The Death Guard, enjoying the greatest favour of Nurgle the Traitor Legions, has dedicated themselves to spreading his countless diseases in the real world. The offspring of Mortarion have transformed into fierce spreaders of contagion, whose swollen bodies and rusted war machines can boast both monstrous resilience and devastating firepower. They are the plague, carriers of decay and terror. Their heavy steps herald the doom of hope and the curse awaiting all who stand in their path. Their touch brings decay to everything, be it flesh, metal or faith. Their very presence brings corruption that consumes worlds. They are the Death Guard, sons of Mortarion, chosen warriors of Nurgle. Fear them and despair. The first sign of an impending attack by the Death Guard is a growing hum that sends shivers down the skin. Then it turns into the roar of a hurricane, as the flapping of countless flies racing over the fetid wasteland of No Man's Land reaches a crescendo. At that moment, through the cacophony, breaks the mournful tolling of bells, the rumble of mighty engines and the gibberish of the damned. A storm rises, carrying the stench of death and clouds of corpse gases teeming with spores that envelop the enemies of the Plague Father. Soon, from the miasmas of corruption emerge the Death Guard. In the cracked lenses of their helmets glows a foul flame, and monstrous poisons drip from their blades. Suffocating gases burst from rusted power packs and furnaces, where rotten flesh burns, desecrating the already poisoned air. Some hoarsely cry battle cries or moaningly recite praises to Grandfather Nurgle, while others burst into hysterical laughter. Their raspy, vile laughter escapes from vox grills, clogged with rotting secretions. The majority of the Death Guard, however, remain silent, announcing their presence solely through the heavy tread of their steps and the hissing of their respirators. Followers of Mortarion are accompanied by slug-like artillery tanks and hovering plague drones of Nurgle. These are demonically infested machines that thirst to exterminate terrified victims. Cultists, covered in boils, extol Nurgle, while the hobbling plague zombies, poxwalkers, groan and grunt. Through the haze, the bloated bodies of the Champions of Decay can be seen marching with their horned helms held high. Everywhere the Death Guard goes, the ground turns into a deadly morass, and from its black waters, through the already torn fabric of reality, deadened plague-bearers and bloated monsters emerge, growing stronger with every moment. Enemies, in a desperate bid to expel these dreadful harbingers of doom, shoot incessantly, while thousands of boils fester their flesh and poison their minds. But the Death Guard advances through the raging storm of bullets as if unseeing, though such a barrage would leave nothing but burning husks from an entire column of tanks. Then the Space Marines themselves open fire, unleashing lethal volleys one after another, assaulting the enemy fortifications with clumps of filth and a hail of poisoned shards, until nothing remains but sodden corpses. In mere seconds, tanks rust and brave warriors fall powerless, their skin covering with boils from which otherworldly parasites emerge. And amidst this nightmare, the sons of the Death Lord relentlessly push forward, decapitating heads and spilling guts with their blades. Blight grenades detonate with a revolting squelch, spraying poisonous filth, and the piles of bodies grow ever higher, while the Death Guard vomits its bile onto the unworthy. 
When the unending cycle of destruction finally undermines the enemy's spirit, the few survivors flee. However, the hope for salvation is deceptive, for a single encounter with the Death Guard is more than enough to infect anyone with incurable diseases. Thus, the defeated unwittingly become heralds of doom and despair, carrying various afflictions with them. In this manner, the Death Guard has conquered countless worlds in the name of the Plague God. The greatest strength of the Death Guard is their inhuman endurance and relentlessness. In an offensive, they exhaust the opponent like a draining force, whereas in defense they are as invincible as a disease in its terminal stage. Waves of enemies crash against the rotten fortifications of the Death Guard, but none can break them. Fueled by dark magic, accompanied by malignant demonic machines, and armed with weapons as vile as they are deadly, the warriors of Mortarion take pride in their ability to withstand any enemy's strike, and then ruthlessly destroy them. However, they fear not just blades and bullets, the affectionate grandfather Nurgle has made his beloved grandchildren utterly impervious to viruses, toxins and poisons from the real world. For them, no combat zone is too harsh, no atmosphere too polluted, and no disease too malignant. Viral bombs, radiation warheads, even the most forbidden of bioweapons, all of these scarcely pose a threat to the decaying flesh of the Death Guard, who gleefully employ the same means against their foes to create a battlefield where only Nurgle's children might survive. The gruesome customs and sinister strategies of the Death Guard are founded on the teachings of their lord, the demonic Primarch Mortarion. Once one of the demigods amongst the Emperor's children, he subsequently became a true progeny of Nurgle, a vast, nightmarish being with lifeless eyes, a demonic ruler whose eternal bitterness and contempt have poisoned his offspring just as surely as the gifts bestowed upon him by the Lord of Decay. Hatred took root in Mortarion from his earliest days. After the Chaos God swept the newborn Primarchs into the warp and scattered them across the galaxy, his capsule fell on the tortured Barbarus, a gloomy, rocky planet with a poisonous atmosphere that only thickened with altitude, dooming its inhabitants to languish in villages amidst forested valleys. Atop the mountains, however, dwelled their monstrous overlords, Xenos, who had fashioned armies from the humans they captured, transforming them into submissive corpses and heaps of mutated flesh. Alas, the young Mortarion fell into the clutches of the greatest of these tyrants, who made him his adopted son and raised him in a forbidden fortress so high in the mountains as the resilient Primarch could endure. For many years Mortarion terrorized the peoples of the lowlands at the behest of his necromancer father, until one day the veil fell from his eyes and the future leader of the 14th Legion realized that the feeble creatures in the valleys were not prey, but his kin. The full account of Mortarion's uprising is documented in the Stygian Scrolls. Suffice to say here he rebelled and led the people of Barbarus in a grueling war against their oppressors. He gathered the best of his warriors into the first Death Guard, heavy infantry and bizarre plate armor that helped endure the poisoned atmosphere. And although Mortarion spearheaded the overthrow of the terrible despots, it was the Emperor who struck the final blow, coming to reclaim his son and continue with the Great Crusade. Mortarion could not forgive how his new father disregarded the work of his entire life, thus planting the seeds of eternal bitterness in his soul. Prior to the ill-starred reunion with the Primarch, the warriors of the 14th Legion were known as the Dusk Raiders. They were so named for the custom of striking just as day turned to night, specializing in the mass infantry assault emerging from darkness to obliterate the enemy with the hail of bolter fire. The raiders were recruited from the hardy inhabitants of Albia, an empire on terror that had long resisted unification. By the time the unification wars had begun, the warlord clans of old Albia had thrown off the tyranny of the last descendants of the unspeakable king and did not readily bend their knee to the emperor, for they refused to have another master. Instead, the Albians confronted the emperor's regiments of thunder warriors with their own battalions of steam-belching proto-dreadnoughts and heavily armoured Ironside soldiers. In battle after battle, the forces of the unification were held at bay, although at a devastating cost to the Albions, who refused to yield despite the imperial onslaught. 
Impressed by the Albion's martial vigour and indomitable bravery, the Emperor called for a ceasefire and sought to overcome the warlord clans through peaceful negotiations, realising that to subdue them by force alone would lead to a protracted war of attrition that would not only decimate his own forces, but also leave him with nothing but a pyrrhic victory. In spite of the opposition from his human advisers and generals, the Emperor pursued peace. It is said that unarmed and dressed in white and crimson, the Emperor stood before the Warlord's Parliament and presented his vision of a future where mankind was reunited and in ascendancy, tyrants overthrown and nightmares vanquished. He offered them glory among the stars and, most crucially, redemption after many centuries of fratricide and bloodshed. Contrary to many expectations, the Warlords of Old Albia embraced the Emperor's vision. The 14th Legion swiftly excelled in the use of tactics and warfare methods inherited from their forebears. Serving as heavy infantry, the Astartes of the 14th Legion were masters of survival and endurance, and quickly earned a reputation among the other newly formed legions as relentless and disciplined warriors. In defence, they were unyielding and indefatigable, capable of standing firm against the most intense barrages and holding their ground against all attackers to the last man. In offence, they systematically obliterated their targets, crashing upon an enemy in wave after wave of armoured warriors, distinguishing themselves in close-range firefights and bloody wars of attrition. Their grey, undecorated power armour began to carry symbols of rank and decoration, now altered to reflect the armorial imagery of Old Albia, symbolising the Emperor's right hand rather than the bloody hand of Narthen Doom. Known for their resilience and stubbornness, the legionnaires born on terror were relentless in attack and steadfast in defence. In spirit, they were sombre, loyal and single-minded and had conquered countless worlds during the Great Crusade before their reunion with their Primarch. On that day, they ceased to be the Dusk Raiders and became the Death Guard. It was then that the 14th Legion took its first steps towards its eventual damnation. Decades of endless battles transformed the Death Guard. Over time, Terra's influence on the Legion became less apparent as the armour and traditions of the Dusk Raiders were altered in favour of the grim military creed of the world of Barbarus. Following the Edict of Nicaea, Mortarion disbanded the Legion's Librarius as he harboured a deep hatred for psychers and sorcerers. His intentions were evident in all aspects of the Legion's restructuring, from the modification of tactical doctrines to the provisioning of equipment, selection of candidates, and the procedures of the Apothecarian. As for the planet Barbarus, rumours circulated that there were proposals to either exterminate its population or relocate them to a cleaner world for the sake of future generations. But Mortarion forbade this. He declared that Barbarus now belonged to his people who had paid for it with their blood over generations. The strongest and youngest sons of this world either fully or partially underwent the process of transformation into the Legiones Astartes, despite the high mortality rate. For them, this was a small price for the right to continue serving their saviour. Despite the legendary resilience of the Death Guard, their combat losses were frighteningly high. When the question of replenishment arose, Barbarus quickly turned into a kind of incubator for new recruits of the Legion, and recruitment from other worlds nearly ceased. Mortarion only occasionally agreed to recruitment from worlds other than Barbarus in cases of excessive losses, since the Legion needed to be battle-ready. However, the planet's wild population was well suited for transformation. Their natural resilience to poisons and toxins was greatly enhanced by the Astartes gene seed. As new space marines from the world of Barbarus arrived, the core from Terra became a minority. The culture and traditions of the Legion changed so much that by the final days of the Great Crusade, tension had increased between the inhabitants of Terra and Barbarus. Resilience was highly honoured in the Legion, and several traditions were also associated with it. This was not just about the ability to go to the end and overcome the hardships and adversities of eternal war, but also resistance to the strongest poisons and toxins. This ability was highly developed among the inhabitants of Barbarus, and the Astartes gene seed only enhanced it. Mortarion often singled out a battle brother to share a ceremonial drink with him, 
It was said that there was no poison or deadly contagion that the Death Guard could not withstand. From an assortment of bowls, dark liquids were mixed and poured into a pair of richly decorated cups. The senses of the Astartes often rebelled against the smell of the toxins. Their implanted neuroglottis resisted at the mere scent of the poisonous brew, but to refuse the cup would be seen as a sign of weakness. The poured distillate often contained a potent mixture of purple poisoning substance, some variety of beetle poison, and other less known compounds. The cups belonged to Mortarion, and in every battle where the Plague Lord personally took to the field, he chose a warrior and shared a portion of poison with him. They drank, strengthening the Legion's unbreakable strength. Mortarion understood that many disapproved of such traditions, but he knew that honours and rewards were sometimes necessary. Warriors needed to know they were valued. Praise had to be given at the right moment. Without it, even the most resilient warrior would ultimately feel undervalued. Mortarion saw in his legionnaires the opportunity to continue the work begun on the world of Barbarus, and to create from them the ideal infantrymen who were easily adaptable, relied on their strength, and used reliable and simple weapons, the supplies of which could be easily replenished. The Death Guard were taught to choose an advantageous position and then break the enemy with mass infantry pressure. They were the anvil to their allies' hammers, or else the bludgeon that battered the foe into submission. Some, amongst Mortarion's brother Primarchs, disparaged his tactics as blunt and unimaginative. In truth, the doctrines of the Death Guard were durable and efficient, and demonstrated a remarkable talent for grassroots martial organization that earned the Death Guard a truly impressive honor roll of victories during the Great Crusade. Mortarion's gene seed made his sons hardy. Through his swiftly imposed regimens of toxin hardening and extreme environment tempering, the former Dusk Raiders became more durable than ever. Thus, the Legion's innate endurance only grew, for Mortarion recruited new Legionnaires from the world of Barbarus. The Death Guard were rightly proud of their indomitable physiology. They deployed into the most hazardous war zones, where even other space marines hesitated to tread and made widespread use of RAD and Phosphex weapons, alongside prescribed viral agents that soon earned them something of a dark reputation amongst the Astartes. Mortarion cared not for the distaste of his peers. His personal mission was the overthrowing of tyrants, being such as the Carrion Lords of Barbarus, and he took pride that his sons could employ their rugged strength to defend the common folk. Still, for all their achievements, the labours of the Death Guard went largely unrecognised. Mortarion was far closer to his brother Horus than to his sire, the Emperor, believing that the former recognised his worth far better than the latter ever would. Worse, the longer they fought to shield the weak from oppression, the more the Death Guard became overly enamoured of their own fortitude and dismissive of those too weak to protect themselves. Their first significant campaign, which Mortarion personally led after taking command of the 14th Legion, was the conquest of the non-compliant hive world of Galaspar. The conquest of the non-compliant hive world of Galaspar remains one of the most remarkable and brutal victories of the Great Crusade's course through the near reaches of the Segmentum Pacificus. Day and night the Death Guard advanced and killed men and women who dared to stand against them. They crushed fortifications, captured strong points one after another, and trampled the corpses of the defenders. The enemies blindly sent battalion after battalion against the armoured giants, hoping to at least overwhelm them with sheer numbers. But the Death Guard were not stopped. They relentlessly stormed the fortified redoubts under a hail of fire, and tore through crowds of people who rushed at them with fists and knives. Fear turned into panic, which could not be overcome even by combat stimulants. The broken and pursued forces of the chapter had nowhere to run, but into the labyrinths of the lower levels of the hive or the radioactive wastelands, but even there they were pursued and killed. When it all ended, the worlds under the control of the capital hastened to submit to imperial compliance under any terms as long as they were spared the Reaper's scythe. Then, a support fleet arrived and was horrified by the massacre and the meek submission of billions of liberated citizens. The people of Galaspar, oppressed subjects of the chapter, rejoiced like children at the opportunity to become subjects of the Emperor and embrace new ways. 
but no efforts of the Adeptus Administratum could distract the residents of Galaspar from carrying out the last decree given by Mortarion before his departure, to count the dead. Kajor Compliance of the 31st Millennium On Kajor, during the Great Crusade, the Death Guard Legion encountered a warrior race of humans that had fallen to barbarism. Kajori warlocks conjured lightning from their flesh, set fires with their thoughts, and cracked the very earth with their shouted oaths. Every night, creatures of witchery hunted in the shadows and killed for the joy of killing. No power comes without a price, and with every victory the Death Guard won, they discovered what that truly meant. At the heart of every city they captured, Death Guard warriors found vast structures they came to know as blood fanes. They destroyed every one, and with each one lost, the strength of their Kajori foes waned. In the end, the Death Guard ground down every ragamuffin force sent against them. Surrender was not in the Kajori's blood, and they died to a man, destroyed by a ruling caste of warlocks, who could not bear to relinquish their power. Mortarion would later recount the tale of this campaign during the Council of Nicaea as one example of many why he took a personal stance against the power of psychers in the Legionis Astartes. Crypt Prosecution Of the 31st millennium, the compliance of Crypt was a relatively short campaign conducted during the Great Crusade by both the Death Guard and the Lunar Wolves Legions against the Orcs upon the frozen plains of the world of Crypt. Fighting together for more than a week across the frozen surface of the planet, the Legionis Astartes turned the blue ice dark with Xenos blood, Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow and his 7th Great Company were known to have fought alongside the Lunar Wolves Captain Garviel Loken and his 10th Company during this action, pre igza Campaign, of the 31st Millennium. This was an Imperial Compliance Campaign that was jointly carried out by the Death Guard and the Emperor's Children Legions. During this campaign, Captain Saul Tarvitz of the Emperor's Children earned the amity of Death Guard Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, demonstrating that despite the reputation of Fulgrim's Astartes as overconfident peacocks, there were still individuals within the ranks of the Three Legion who embodied the ideals of the Imperium. The two became honor brothers, inscribing a small eagle on each other's vambrace with a knife, a symbol of the battle debt they owed to one another. When they clasped each other's vambraces in a warrior's handshake, the two eagles joined together to form the Imperial Aquila. Battle of Gyros Thravian of the 30th millennium, the Battle of Gyros Thravian was a massive joint Imperial compliance operation conducted by three Space Marine legions, the Lunar Wolves, Death Guard and Imperial Fists, against the profoundly formidable Orc warboss Garkul Blackfang. Despite the formidable strength arrayed against the vile Greenskin, it was the Imperial forces who were rapidly nearing defeat. It was then that the Emperor himself, aboard his flagship Bucephalus, came to the aid of his sons. He led personally a contingent of 1,000 Legio Custodes into the heart of the formidable Orc Horde. Blackfang was confronted by the Emperor and slain atop his Gargant, while the Custodians proceeded to decimate the rest of the Greenskin Horde. The Custodians accounted for the slaughter of the Orcs, annihilating over 100,000 of the savage Xenos, with the loss of only three custodians. Following their momentous victory, the Emperor commemorated the custodian sacrifice by engraving the names of the three fallen custodians into his own personal power armor. Jorgol Execution, the year 5 of the 31st millennium, the Jorgol Campaign was executed during the Great Crusade against a Xenos race of humanoid aliens known as the Jorgol. They possessed a basic humanoid anatomy, and also bled dark, crimson-coloured blood, similar in hue to that of a human's. However, their brain and central nervous system were located inside their chest cavity. Nearly all Yorgali featured extensive cybernetic physical enhancements to augment their physical forms and enhance their fighting capabilities. First, Captain Callus Typhon offered support to the Primarch while Commander Ignatius Grulgor breached the drive cluster and seized control of the Cylinder World's motive power centre. Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, along with an elite cadre from the Sisters of Silence, 
neutralized the construct's hatcheries. The Adeptus Mechanicus petitioned Mortarion for a few days to plunder the alien craft for its technology. The Primarch refused the request, having been ordered to eradicate the Xenos threat. Nothing was to be left of the aliens. When the Heresy split the Imperium into fragments, Mortarion was among the first to side with the Warmaster. In his name, the Death Guard blazed a bloody trail through the ranks of their former brethren, from Istvan III to Terra itself. Following Horus's order, the Death Guard eliminated those who wished to remain loyal to the Emperor. It is estimated that Mortarion's legion had been reduced by well over 25,000 casualties, counting both the stubborn Terran loyalists betrayed to their deaths in the ash-mantled ruins of Istvan III, and Mortarion's sons of Barbarus, whose lives had been spent to purchase their demise. When news of the Warmaster's betrayal reached Terra, Primarch Rogel Dawn appealed to the Loyalist legions of Space Marines with the goal of punishing the Renegades, and a new battle unfolded on Istvan V. There, the legion deployed almost all of its remaining armoured vehicles. The Death Guard held the defence on the left flank, where the Salamanders advanced. They flooded the trenches with creeping Prometheum, to which the Death Guard responded with clouds of poisonous gases. Over time, when the ranks of the warriors' supporters began to buckle, Mortarion himself entered the battlefield. He killed with a grim efficiency, without a hint of ferocity or bloodlust, and his warriors fought just as stubbornly, in cold silence. Where Mortarion stood, the attacking waves of Loyalists broke against him, as against a rock. The Loyalists were defeated, and the flame ignited on Istvan V plunged the entire Imperium into chaos. This war remained in the annals as the Horus Heresy. However, some Primarchs did not learn of the rebellion right away. For instance, Jagatai Khan was quite far away, and when troubling news began to reach him, he didn't know what to do. After Primarch of the White Scars refused to assist Lehman Russ and his battered fleet in the Alaxis Nebula, he went to the destroyed world of the Thousand Suns in search of answers for himself. There he encountered Mortarion, who tried to persuade his brother to join the Warmaster's cause. The Warhawk refused, and they clashed. Ultimately, Mortarion retreated, and Jagatai returned to his flagship and ordered a course set for terror. For the next four years, the Death Guard continuously harassed the White Scar's fleet, which was trapped far from terror due to the massive warp storm. Seeing no other choice, the White Scars were forced to begin a hit-and-run guerrilla campaign against the Traitor Legion, forces to slow their advance on the throne world. The White Scars proceeded to lose nearly one-fifth of their fighting forces over the course of the next few years. After nearly four years, the Death Guard, working with the Emperor's children, was slowly being boxed in. However, the White Scars managed to discover a strange navigator in the Catalus Warp Rift, where there was an artifact, a prototype of the Emperor's own Golden Throne. Stormseer Targutai Yesugai sacrificed himself so his brothers could escape from their pursuers. Battle of Perditus, the year 8 of the 31st millennium. When the Dark Angels received intelligence from an astropathic message from the nearby Perditus system, they acted accordingly and moved to intercept. Upon arrival, they interrupted the month-long conflict between the 98th Clan Company of the Iron Hands and a large contingent of the Death Guard, led by First Captain Callus Typhon. Both sides had been vying for an ancient sentient device known as the Tuchulka Engine. This device was part of a triumvirate of similar sentient machines, which, when combined, could create temporal rifts bridging space and time. Faced with the prospect of confronting the entirety of the much larger fleet of the First Legion, both factions retreated from the planet's surface at the request of the Lion. Wary of the motives of both sides, the Lion ensured the device did not fall into the hands of the Death Guard. The incident at Dwell, in the year 9 of the 31st millennium, saw one of the surviving commanders of the Shattered Legion cells, Shadrach Medicine, launching a daring assassination attempt on the Warmaster. With his brother Primarchs, Fulgrim and Mortarion by his side, Horus survived the attempt. But having recognized the true threat, 
granted Captain Tybalt Marr permission to take any action he deemed necessary to eradicate the so-called Shattered Legions. In the same year, the Death Guard participated in the assault on Molek, site of the secret gates used by the Emperor to gain his power. The planet's air defence batteries were overwhelmed. The presence of two Legion fleets in close orbit made them an insurmountable force, and their devastating broadsides transformed entire regions of Molek into glassy deserts. Mount Torga was struck by a mass of bunker penetrators, and not even its numerous point defences could prevent the holdfast of the Ordo Reductor from being engulfed in an inferno. Fires blazed beneath the mountain, fires that would continue burning for another 70 years before finally collapsing the mountain. The cities of Goshen, Imperatum, and the twin fortress cities of Leosta and Luther were bombed, as were the coastal cities of Desqua and Vitha. Vitha nearly collapsed into the ocean as the rock upon which it was founded crumbled under the barrage's weight. A red rain fell upon Carnis with molten iron and micro-debris from the orbiting conflict falling like incendiary bullets. The Death Guard landed on the eastern outskirts of the continent, striking at tank divisions. Then, drop pods crashed into the hangars, from which emerged soldiers of the Death Guard. Following that, Mortarion released the resurrected Ignatius Grulgor, whose mere presence obliterated the impassable jungles. Where Ignatius Grulgor advanced, only devastation remained. Behind him, the Death Guard advanced across a distance of 50 kilometers. Consequently, Molek fell before the warriors, and they seized that for which they had come. Thus, the Death Guard carved a bloody path, not only on Molek, but across the galaxy to reach terror. However, en route, they were afflicted by the Destroyer Plague, a terrifying curse. During Horus's final assault on terror, the fleet of the Death Guard was caught adrift in a stillness amidst an impenetrable warp storm. The fleet helplessly drifted in the Immaterium when the Destroyer arrived. The virulent plagues infected the fleet while they drifted aimlessly through the warp, making a mockery of the Death Guard's legendary resistance to toxins and contagions. For never before had they succumbed to the diseases, infections and poisons that tormented ordinary men. The pestilential atmosphere swept through the entire fleet, churned in the legionnaires' guts, swelled and stretched their superhuman bodies, transforming them into grotesque monsters pockmarked with pustules. An external force decayed the space marines from within and bestowed upon them a vile appearance from the outside. With each passing minute, the condition of the Death Guard worsened. The incredible endurance of the Astartes turned against them as their bodies refused to die, even while being torn apart by the mortal agonies of a horrifying transformation. The Legionnaire's suffering was unimaginable, but the worst fate befell Mortarion himself. The Primarch, as if finding himself again at the mountain summit of the world barbarous, was dying of poison, devoid of the grace of oblivion and the Emperor's assistance, which had saved him many years ago. It was known to none but Mortarion himself whether, in those terrible hours, he realized the loss of everything he had fought for before, understood that he had brought the curse upon himself and the entire Legion, or abandoned the remnants of loyalty to the Father or humanity. Unable to endure the agony any longer, the Primarch pledged himself and his warriors to the service of the Warp for liberation from the torture. An otherworldly being, as if only waiting for this moment, answered his call. From the hellish abyss of the Empyrean, a great entity known as Nurgle, Lord of Decay, Plague Father, arose with outstretched arms and embraced Mortarion and his Death Guard. Henceforth they belonged to a new master. During his years on the World Barbarous, Mortarion began to hate Psykers. The Corpse Masters used their abilities to animate armies of dead puppets, and thus the Primarch carried with him to the stars a distrust of sorcerers. He was the loudest, and most insistent in condemning the creation of librariums among the Legion of Astartes. And it was Mortarion's fierce aversion that turned the unfortunate Council of Nicaea from a court into a witch hunt. The Primarch banned the training of librarians in his Legion and, nonetheless, could not entirely rid himself of the presence of psychers. Mortarion considered navigators, astropaths and the like a necessary evil, 
which he in turn sought to rationalize through his fascination with secret pseudosciences. He could not prevent the recruitment of covert psychers into the ranks of the Death Guard, but he demanded that all such legionnaires suppress their powers under the threat of disgrace and exile. One of the sleeping psychers was Callus Typhon, captain of the First Company and one of Mortarion's most trusted warriors. Typhon embraced the teachings and worship of the Chaos Gods brought by the Warrior Lodges with all his heart. In addition, the Destroyer Plague, having fulfilled its task, immersed itself in the body of Callus Typhon, transforming him into a chosen champion of Nurgle. Was this a mere coincidence, or was it a reward for successful betrayal that brought the long-awaited liberation from Mortarion's senseless edicts? It seemed that, after the monstrous transformation, the Death Guard no longer considered their previous state of any significance, for no one remained sane enough to contemplate this matter. The fleet of the 14th Legion, having burst forth from the warp, bore little resemblance to its former self. The shining armour of the once champions of the Imperium was gone, replaced by nauseatingly green-hued cloaks. The sleek lines of the proud Space Marines' bodies were concealed beneath swollen flesh sacks, marked with ulcers, scabs and weeping sores. Worms writhed in the warriors' incurable wounds, flies swarmed around them in dense clouds. The legionnaires reeked of decay. Even their weapons and war machines mutated, now functioning through the vile sorcery of chaos. They glowed with a sparkly green energy and oozed gangrenous pus. Then came the Grand Siege of Terror, where the Legion had the honour of being the first to land on the surface of humanity's cradle, and following them were the World Eaters. The presence of Mortarion had an unusual effect on the defenders of the palace. Their souls were touched by despair, which intensified with each passing day. The White Scars came out to fight the Plague Marines. They lost their advantage of speed on the battlefield, for the entire combat zone was literally drowning in the demons of Nurgle. Typhus aided Zardu Lyak in summoning the influence of the demon Korbak's utter blight into the Imperial Palace to undermine the Empire's defence there. Then he was ordered to seize the Astronomicon. However, he only slightly redeployed his forces, for the Reaper engaged in combat with Jagatai Khan. Many understood that a schism was brewing among the ranks of the traitors, thus each legion sought to preemptively secure advantageous positions in case of a backstab. Typhus, however, awaited the defeat of the Primarch to remain the sole commander of the Death Guard on Terror. Jagatai provoked Mortarion throughout the duel with taunts and insults to make the traitor make a mistake. The Death Lord grew angry, broke the limbs of Khan, and impaled him on the blade of his scythe to savour his own triumph. But this is precisely what the Hawk had anticipated. Finding himself close enough to the betrayer brother, Khan dealt a fatal blow. Subsequently, the maimed Khan was hastily evacuated to Malkador, while Mortarion was banished into the warp, and the effect of the Destroyer Plague ceased. The White Scars finished off the remnants of the Death Guard at Lion's Gate. When Horus's rebellion ended in failure, the Death Guard organized a retreat into the Eye of Terror, plundering the encountered planets. Nothing at all remained of the former Dusk Raiders, their place was completely taken over by the Death Guard, standing regretlessly at the end of the path to damnation amidst spreading rot. The warriors transformed into plague marines, noxious mockeries of their former selves, teeming with the gifts of Grandfather Nurgle. Some of the sons of Mortarion embraced their new visages and believed that among all mortals only they were worthy of the patronage of the Lord of Decay. Others loathed the disease and the weakness it revealed in them, and thus wished to unleash plague and destruction upon the entire galaxy, degrading it to their level. The third descended into madness, surrendering to infectious merriment or grim, self-destructive sorrow. Whatever the cause, the Death Guard eternally pledged their bodies and souls to the service of the Plague Father, and in the aftermath of the Tenth Black Crusade, their devotion only intensified. Soon, Mortarion acquired the greatest gift of Nurgle, demonhood, and a world that he could now alter as he saw fit. The Plague Planet is a grim reflection of an already bleak world. It is the renewed Barbarus, reborn into an even more terrifying form, 
Originally an elder world known as Eliathada, meaning sublime soul garden, prideful wasteland, or dry valley of dreams, to this day many are fascinated that a single word can embody such a myriad of meanings. Perhaps this is the hidden reason why Mortarion chose this planet. Perhaps the Primarch desired to take something pure to twist and defile it. Perhaps the Primarch sensed in it some sort of fateful resonance. Now it resembles a mist-enshrouded underworld where diseases rage and barbarian tribes struggle for a nightmarish existence among rotting forests and bogs. Storm-laden skies bite into the worm-eaten mountains that rise to pierce the churning skies, their flanks roamed by plague-ridden abominations that should be dead yet still prey on human flesh. Higher, atop the peaks, the Death Guard maintain their fortresses as once the Carrion Lords of Barbarus ruled from on high reveling in the bitter irony that they have become the very despots they once fought to depose. The clouds of contagion that wreathe these slab-sided, rusting citadels are inimical to life. None but the Death Guard can endure even a single breath of them. Often this was enough to exterminate entire invading armies that managed to penetrate the salvo fire of orbital batteries placed atop each ridge. Over ten millennia, their peaks rose ever higher, steeper, pressing against one another until the entire surface of the planet began to resemble the skin of a giant porcupine. The valleys burned with a bright green fire, while the peaks were black as the souls of their creators. Every inch of land beneath the mountains is riddled with tunnels housing a colossal army once composed of human-like beings, but now they more closely resemble work-weary half-beasts. They scurry along fissures filled with toxic vapours, extracting ever more materials for the growing mud peaks. They are sustained only by fervent faith and the raw flesh of their own dead. Inhaling spore-infested air which makes their mutations ever more apparent, they hurry along ancient paths, carrying bundles on their deformed backs. As the galaxy ages, the paths are trodden ever deeper, leading further beneath the planet's crust while the mountains above them rise ever higher. Every shade on the planet's surface is intensified to painful brightness. Some colours do not even exist in the material universe, and their names can only be spoken by demons. From afar, Eliathada gleams like a beacon in the night. Among the suppurating valleys, tri-lobed platforms of rusted iron rise, upon which mortal tribal champions battle for the right to join the ranks of the Death Guard. Orbiting above are chained rings of biomechanical defence platforms and festering orbital docks, at which the plague fleets feast like flies on a carcass. Shrines to Nurgle, crawling molluscoid fortresses, smog-spewing plague factories and crackling alchemical shield generators dot the planet's surface. The world's mortal citizens cower in tiny villages, serving their supreme masters of the Death Guard, who reside in mighty fortress citadels far above. The surface of the planet harbours incarnations of nightmares. The greatest of all, though, are the seven mountaintop keeps of the Death Guard's plague companies, one company ruling over each in their own uniquely revolting fashions. The largest of these, known as the Black Mance, stretches between the three highest peaks of the plague planet and serves as Mortarian's personal keep. The dungeons and laboratories of this nightmarish fastness conceal horrors of the very darkest kind. No one speaks of this palace beyond the plague planet. Even amongst the denizens of the eye, few can tell of it, aside from vague rumours of something colossal and awe-inspiring. The fortress walls rise from depths suffused with a green glow. Hundreds of metres of smooth stone without a single crevice. The palace, resembling a mountain in itself, stretches far beyond practical considerations, more likely a creation of rampant megalomania. Towers entwine one another, reaching upwards, all topped with sharp spires and draped with lanterns. Stone stairways twist along tilting walls. Some lead somewhere, while others end in a fall into a stake-filled trap or a smoking cauldron. Cathedral cathedrals dedicated to Nurgle, empty and resonant, rise like abandoned tombs and quietly crumble amidst the scents of incense and the sweet rot of the dead, the dying, and those returning to life anew. Not all of the Death Guard have become accustomed to its size. Rumours circulated that the mansion is ever-growing. It is said that Mortarion has invested this mansion with many symbolic nuances. 
For example, the gates are seven centimeters higher than the Eternity Gate on Terra, just by seven. And the dome of the palace is slightly higher than the Senatorum Imperialis. The walls are steeper by seven degrees and so on. The court of the Death Lord is always teeming with petitioners, envoys, sorcerers and seers. Half-beasts are lined up on the many-kilometer bastions together with packs of demons scattered here and there. Columns of pilgrims, so numerous that they clog half the roads of the continent, continuously pour into the sliding gates. They are ceaselessly preached to by the servants of the god, and the flow of their eloquence is only interrupted by the dull ringing of cracked bells. Pilgrims stare out from beneath their moth-eaten hoods, dreaming only of one of their brothers falling so they might find some sustenance. Above all this, skiffs and artillery barges sail through the air, drawing ink-black streaks of smoke across the hot aurora-pierced night. Even higher, the cries of lost souls can be heard, otherworldly like the singing of whales ringing in their spectral unfathomability. Within those compounds are hidden other courtyards. In some places, astrologers confer with rotating models of star systems and lift astrolabes up to narrow windows of thick glass. In others, alchemists toil over shelves cluttered with bubbling vessels. In yet others, surgeons slide knives across whetstones then turn to the trembling figures strapped to tables. Cultists inscribe something upon stone tablets, dipping their quills in the bloody innards of still living victims. Demonologists bind screeching entities within hastily drawn pentagrams. The air around boils and bursts from the abomination unfolding. Butchers in blood-stained aprons stream out of massive slaughterhouses, while pharmacists buckle under the weight of flasks filled with viral cultures. It is always noisy and bustling. Life boils everywhere, every inch of flesh covered in a sinister rash and pale as the skin of a corpse. Every belly sags and is dotted with boils. Clouds of steam rise from copper incense burners. Tongues of green flame burst from the holes cut into the walls of pulsating flesh. Rooms and corridors stretch deep underground and high towards the towers above. And all this is full of life, death and many intermediate states. Few venture further, where the noise of the congregation fades and half-ruined arches lead to chasms crossed only by rotting rope bridges. There are wells delved into the very heart of the planet from which unnatural steam erupts. Everywhere the distant hum of machinery and muffled cries reverberate. Echoes dance around as if walls that should not exist have been erected or secret rooms lie nearby. This road leads to the inner gates, constructed in the likeness of the portals of the Sigilite himself. They are larger and bear ancient terror patterns, twisted to depict terrestrial manifestations of the whims of Grandfather Nurgle. On either side of the gate stand two warriors of the Death Shroud, motionless and almost invisible in the thickening darkness. They utter not a word, allowing passage to only those ordered by the Primarch. And such orders are exceedingly rare. Only a few who proceed further will notice that the last signs of activity there vanish. It is cold, ceilings covered in frost. The floor is slippery from a layer of ice and dark columns dimly glisten. Swarms of flies behave sluggishly. They no longer buzz but barely crawl between shaded crypts. From the spears adorning the ceiling arches hang long banners, each inscribed with the names of worlds. Scattered across the stone floor are half-frozen scrolls, covered in the scripts of men and xenos. At the end of the central hall, towers a shadow-wrapped throne. Its high back is carved with grooves and crowned with various spikes upon which skulls are impaled. Thick, sticky webs entangle it, with giant spiders settled in their centre. The throne is too grand for any mortal. Originally, when it was first crafted, the throne was smaller, but its granite and ivory base gradually cracked and expanded, enlarging to match the size of its owner. Here, in absolute darkness and cold, those few who are permitted by Mortarian can find their Primarch. However, with Mortarian's return to active leadership of the Death Guard following the opening of the Great Rift, the year 999 of the 41st millennium, a more formal Legion organization re-emerged. Now, in the era Indomitus, the Death Guard are among the most ordered and coherent of all the surviving traitor legions. The structure has changed, but the principles of legion formation still revolve around the sacred number seven. 
each of the so-called seven plague companies that comprise the post-heresy Death Guard thus numbers thousands of warriors, utterly dwarfing their equivalent formations amongst the loyalist Space Marine chapters of the late 41st millennium. The Lord Commander of each Plague Company, usually a Death Guard Lord or Demon Prince of Nurgle, First Plague Company, Harbingers. This is the army of Typhus the Traveller. Its ranks are infested with hundreds of different strains of the zombie plague, including Shamblerot, the Groaning and Biter's Pox. Second Plague Company, the Ferric Blight, a company that specialises in mechanised assaults and has a lot of tanks. Its warriors bear the Ferric Blight, which speckles their armour and vehicles with crawling rust that can swiftly infest the foe. Third Plague Company, Mortarian's Anvil, a company that specialises in trench warfare and sieges. They carry the Gloaming Bloat, a plague of fever sweats that slicks their armour and causes them to speak in wet gurgles. Its commanding Death Guard Lord, Gothax the Morose, is renowned for ensuring that seven Blightbringers accompany him as a trudging retinue at all times. In the gruelling sieges and meat grinders favoured by the Third Plague Company, the entropic shockwaves of their toxins of misery are invaluable. Fourth Plague Company, the Wretched. The company is ruled over by the Gestalt demon known as the Eater of Lives. Its legionaries carry the Eater Plague, also called Drizzle Flesh, Pock Chewer and the Endless Gift, and its inhuman master favours Death Guard Sorcerers and summoning of other Nurglite demons. Fifth Plague Company, the Poxmongers. The company makes great use of diseased demon engines. Its forces carry the Sanguis Flux, which causes endless half-clotted bleeding and leaves foul red-black trails behind them wherever they go. Sixth Plague Company, the Ferrymen, or Brethren of the Fly. They are stationed on fleets and specialise in boarding attacks with the aim of capturing new ships for the plague fleets. Among them are many Blightlord Terminators, within which swarms of buzzing parasites have taken residence. Seventh Plague Company, Mortarian's Chosen Sons. They are dark alchemists and are blessed by Nurgle with the crawling pustulance, also known as boil blight, lump and splatter or Nurgle's fruit. In general, each plague company is further divided into seven smaller units called sepsis cohorts. Sepsis cohorts number around 700 plague marines supported by infected auxiliaries, armor formations and demon engines, as well as gifts of Nurgle. Each sepsis cohort is divided into two maledictums. In turn, each maledictum is divided into seven colonies. Colonies comprise seven squads of seven traitor legionaries led by a powerful Death Guard Lord and accompanied by lesser chaos champions of Nurgle, armoured vehicles, attendant demons and demon engines. The first colony of each sepsis cohort's maledictums often consists solely of Blight Lord Terminators, akin to a standard Space Marine chapter's elite first company. For all its theoretical cohesion, in reality the Death Guard Legion is still fragmented, like most Chaos Space Marine formations across thousands of galactic war zones, often at the whims of Chaos Lords, Chaos Champions and the like. These warbands vary significantly in size and composition, but all are known as Vectoriums. One of the most feared Vectoriums of the Death Guard, the Tainted Sons earned the favour of Mortarion himself, while fighting alongside him during the endless campaigns against the other forces of chaos within the Eye of Terror. Unleashed at last upon the ailing Imperium, Death Guard Lord Gulgoth the Afflictor and his hideously bloated warriors embody the implacable fortitude and relentless aggression of the 14th Legion and make use of every available weapon in their ongoing war against the Imperium. Their opposite is the Pallid Hand. Masters of the Armoured Assault, the Pallid Hand employ a greater number of Chaos Predators and Chaos Land Raiders than any other Vectorium of the Death Guard. Those enemies not crushed beneath their rusted treads are blasted apart by indiscriminate artillery bombardments. The Pallid Hand are part of the Second Plague Company of the Death Guard, and thus are willing hosts of the warp-spawned plague known as the Ferric Blight, which furs their armour and tanks alike with flaking contagious rust. When an Imperial Agri-World is infected with one of the innumerable poxes of Nurgle, the warband known as the Fecund Ones are often the culprits. Belonging to the alchemically gifted Seventh Plague Company, 
The fecund ones are masters of brewing virulent blights and parasitic phages. Belonging to the alchemically gifted Seventh Plague Company, the fecund ones are masters of brewing virulent blights and parasitic phages. The Putrid Choir are a warband or vectorium of the Death Guard Traitor Legion's Third Plague Company. The Putrid Choir's march to battle is signalled by the baleful toll of the Vectorium's toxins of misery, wielded by its Blightbringers. Accompanying this maddening percussion come discordant battle dirges sung in praise of Grandfather Nurgle. Digging in amidst enemy territory, the Putrid Choir drive their foes mad with their droning cacophony, the enemy giving up defended positions and charging their guns rather than face the entropic oral torment. The Glooming Lords is a warband or vectorium of the Death Guard Traitor Legion's Sixth Plague Company. The Glooming Lords are a morose host of killers who march to war surrounded by colossal clouds of droning black demon flies. They harbour a particular hatred for the sorcerous warbands of Zinch, whose vibrant, colourful vigour they regard as insufferable. Belonging to the Sixth Plague Company, the Ferrymen, the Glooming Lords are led by heavy formations of Blightlord Terminators. Their bodies seethe with crawling flies as they crush the enemy contemptuously underfoot. The Apostles of Contagion. They are a Vectorium of the Fourth Plague Company, favouring viral bombardment and sorcerous saturation before the battle begins. They march from amidst billowing clouds of corrosive spores and infectious vapours, their enemies screaming and putrefying even as they struggle to fight back. As the Apostles chant the praise of Nurgle, Packs of demons rise from the organic slurry to join the fight, overrunning the enemy with a tide of bloated bodies. Vectorium Mouldering Claw They like to advance upon the enemy line as quickly as possible, before hacking and bludgeoning them with plague-ridden blades, flails and axes. These are warriors of the First Plague Company, fanatically devoted to Typhus's cause, and the diseases they spread bring fresh waves of hideous plague zombies staggering into the grim light of battle, pinning the foe amidst groaning masses of undead flesh before the mouldering claw close in to finish the job. Weeping Legion The Weeping Legion is so named because its plague marines enter battle covered in the foul gore of their own continuously dripping wounds. With each layer of rancid filth and scabbing black blood that encrusts their armour, these clot-festooned warriors of the Death Guard become even more resistant to damage. Battling as part of the Fifth Plague Company, the Weeping Legion are heavily supported by foul demon engines that they daub with gobbets of their polluted vitae. The Carrion Hounds is a vectorium of the Death Guard Traitor Legion. Vast hordes of poxwalkers screen the advance of the Carrion Hounds, the warriors of this vile host harbour a profound affection for their shambling monstrosities, frequently creating macabre collections of infected souls, ranging from defeated Astra Militarum regiments to entire noble lineages. The Heralds of Despair find delight in protracted sieges, adopting an obsessively methodical approach to warfare. Following intense bombardments and the disruption of supply chains, they encase an adversary's force within a fortress, subsequently observing as decay and despair engulf the occupants. The corpse makers regard the demolition of the Imperium's most formidable bastions as their sacrilegious responsibility. Penetrating the bedrock of enemy strongholds like maggots through carrion, they erode and defile the foundations until the entire edifice collapses, the poisoned chalice. This group is under the command of unhinged assemblies of foul blight spawn and putrefiers. They rampage across the galaxy with fervent zeal, relentlessly seeking grotesque components and unfortunate test subjects in their quest to concoct the ultimate plague. Breaking away from Mortarian's dominion, the favoured sons pursue the benedictions of Nurgle independently. Each heretic Astartes within this warband endeavours to surpass his comrades aspiring to attain demonhood. Their leader, Vermithrus the Blighted, a demon prince, is encircled by gruesome Nurgle's champions. The Rotworm Brotherhood constitutes a splinter group led by a council of Death Guard sorcerers who have defied Mortarion's authority. Their mission is to proliferate like pathogens and disseminate the worship of Nurgle, undermining civilizations before the Rotworm Brotherhood commences its desecration.